Good morning. Good morning, and you may be seated. Welcome to Brushy Creek Baptist Church. And so we're so glad that you are here with us, and we're so glad that you're with us online as well. Uh, this morning, I want to just remind you, as we're in the midst of everything, our staff meet right here at 12 o'clock on Mondays to pray. No other agenda. We just we come together and we just pray. We're praying for our church, our community, our country, all the things that are going on. Praying for our search committees that are out there. And so um, you can come and join us if you'd like here at 12, or you can just pray with us wherever you are at 12 o'clock on Mondays. As we just, you know, the Lord is the only one. <laughs> he is in control, and He is the only one where our help is going to come from through all of this. So uh, with that said, let's, let's just go to Him in prayer now as we continue in worship. Father, we just, uh, God, we call out to you this morning. God, we need more of you. And Father, we just, uh, we ask that your spirit would come and move and work in just great and powerful ways. God, we need you more than ever. And so, Father, we just pray that you would just send revival. God, that it would begin here at Brushy Creek and spill out into our community, into our state, into our country. Father, we, um, we ask now that as we continue with our service, uh, Father, everything we say and do would glorify and honor you. God, I thank you for the faithfulness of your people that have allowed the ministry of the gospel to continue to go forth in these times. God, would you take it, use it, multiply it, so that others may come to know you. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Nineteen seventy six, Limestone College, Denise and I met on the day that we were moving in. After a while we started dating. We dated on and off, mostly on, uh, for the four years that we were at Limestone. We got married on July twenty sixth, nineteen eighty, and it's been three children and seven grandchildren so far later. Um, we've been together for forty years, and I, I can tell you, marriage is a good thing. And the book of Proverbs is correct when it says that he who finds a good wife has found a good thing, a wonderful thing. Her worth is far above rubies. Um, Denise will join us this morning in our second service, but I can just tell you I'm very thankful uh, that we've been together and that our marriage is good and solid. And we look forward to the next 40 years being together. You know... Um, and thank you for praying for us on our trip. Yes, California is the land of fruits and nuts, and uh, <laughs> that hasn't changed that I can tell, but it is an absolutely beautiful place that you can honestly understand how it is that people want to live out there just for um, the environment that they live in. So we had, we had a safe trip and had a great time with our son, his wife, and our four grandchildren there, but it's always good to be home, always. No matter where you roam, there's no place like home. That's an oldie but a goodie. Today, I thought we would take a break from the book of James. We'll go back there um, next week and be in James chapter 2. We'll resume our walk through the book of James. But I thought today, since Denise and I have been married 40 years, that we would take a look at what the Bible has to say about marriage. So, this is, I titled this message, Lessons That I Learned on the Love Boat. Denise and I went on a cruise a few years ago, and some of you might remember a TV show that was very popular back in the 70s and 80s called The Love Boat. They were playing a little bit of that theme, I think, with the, the picture that they had up there. It was one of the top-rated shows, and it was very interesting. It starred, um, uh, the, the captain was Meryl Steuben. Captain Steuben was his name. And people that would get on the love boat, the whole plot was it would begin with couples getting on with problems. And you would hear about these problems and probably before the first commercial break. Now, before the last commercial break, all of the problems of the people that got on the love boat were solved. And when they got off after the last commercial break, it showed them all getting off the boat and everything was just absolutely peachy you would think that they never had a problem in the world. 
And so Denise and I were kind of interested to see what was going to happen. I mean, we felt like our marriage is pretty good, but my goodness, if you've got people in serious trouble can take a cruise, and after that cruise, the, the improvement in their relationship, well, we were, we were pretty stoked about what that might look like. Now, the miraculous transformation that we thought we were going to have didn't really materialize, but there are some things that I learned, what I would call, on the love boat, about marriage and the first thing is is what to do in case of emergency now when you get on before you get on a cruise ship just like before you get on an airplane they tell you they spend hours assuring you that nothing possibly can go wrong that your money is well invested you don't have to be afraid you don't have to worry they've got the best crew the best the best people in the world it's the finest ship it has all of the safety features you could ever want or imagine every comfort you don't worry about a thing everything's fine everything's secure the minute you get on the boat they say we're gonna have a mustard drill now what a mustard drill is is they have something called muster stations and they call you to go stand in a specific place where they want you to be when the ship starts to sink and they give you your emergency kit now, your emergency kit is a life jacket, it's good, it has a whistle attached to it, which, you know, when I saw that, I kind of had a Titanic flashback, I'm not going to lie. I could just see her, you know, floating in the water, blowing, anyway. I didn't, it, but we were, we were cruising the Bahamas, cause, so we figured if we had to go in the water, that the temperature of the water was not going to be the problem, it would be the occupants of the water that live there that we would have to be worried about. And also, on the life jacket, it had a flashing light. Now, they said the light would come on automatically when we hit the water and begin to flash. What they didn't tell you is so that that's where they can find your body. Once you get in the water, they want to be able to locate you. So that's why they put the little flashing light on there. It makes it easier for the crews that are coming by to pick you up. Well, we did all of this, and it made me think about emergency kits for marriage. Now, emergencies on cruise lines, thankfully, are pretty rare. But an emergency in a marriage, it's guaranteed. At some point in your relationship, if you've been married one year, 10 minutes, 40 years, you're going to have an emergency. Something's going to happen that's unexpected, and you need an emergency kit. So here is a marriage emergency kit. Number one, how to deal with anger. That's one of the first things you need to know if you're going to have a successful marriage. James chapter 1, verse 19. We talked about this. Listen to this passage again. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone it should be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. You know, most of the time we're quick to speak, slow to hear, and that causes bad situations in relationships. When you get into an argument with your spouse, when you get angry, one of the most important things is to listen to what your spouse is saying. Don't pay so much attention to their actions in terms of whether they're mad or not or what kind of emotion is being expressed. Try to kind of block all of that out and listen to what's being said. Because if you can communicate even when you're mad, if you can communicate and listen and digest and think before you speak, the chances of you being able to get your relationship back on track, they grow exponentially. Digest what your spouse is saying and try not to react to the words that they use. Try not to let that be something that makes you mad. In other words, a lot of times a, a, an argument can begin in anger and because of the words that are said and the way that they're said, the anger escalates rather than de-escalate. And what you want to do when you get into a situation when two people are mad is you want to let the steam out and then listen to what the heart says rather than listening to what's being motivated by the anger. Here's the second thing about anger. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Something you need to think about. Anger is a genuine emotion. It's something that was given to us by God. There are things that we should be angry about. I mean, when Jesus cleared the temple, 
he was angry. It wasn't a temper tantrum. It was a righteous indignation over the behavior of something that was undermining God, his father. The temple was being used for something it was never supposed to be used. By the way, did you know they overheard a conversation that day in the temple? Somebody asked another guy, he said, what happened in the temple? Do you have any idea? And the guy said, all I know, Jesus shoved me. This is all I know. So let me let that sit for a second. You have to think about that for a second. So anger, anger doesn't need to be a temper tamper. It doesn't need to be an explosion, but it also should not be something that you hold on to. Treat anger the way the Israelites treated manna. They didn't store any of it up because if they stored it up, what they discovered was the next day it was bad. It was, it was something that would hurt them. Anger is the same way. When it comes, you have to put it away you can't hold on to it because anger internalized causes a lot of problems it can cause health problems it can cause depression it can cause a marriage that could be doing well to not do so well third thing in your emergency kit how to offer forgiveness Ephesians 4 32 says be kind to one another tender-hearted listen to this part it's important forgiving each other just as God in Christ has forgiven you now Forgiveness is closely associated with anger because it's possible to still be angry and forgive. But it's best to lay the anger aside at the same time that you offer forgiveness. And are you supposed to offer forgiveness? Well, Jesus talked about this and we've talked about it. Jesus said seven times 70 is the number of times. If you get mad with your spouse, if they do something wrong, you have a responsibility if you love them and if you love the Lord and if you realize that God has forgiven you, then you don't have the right to not forgive someone else, especially someone that you're spending your life with. So learn to forgive. Don't pack up, don't pack a grudge. Don't carry something around inside. Third thing, how to be patient. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says, Therefore I, prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called, with humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit of the, in the bond of peace. Let me ask you something. Have you ever looked at the newspaper of people that had gotten engaged? I mean, you know, they put their engagement pictures in the paper. Now they put them online, but it's the same thing. You can see them. You ever wonder, you look at those pictures, and then you go to the mall. And at the mall, you see ugly people walking around. And then you begin to wonder, when you see engagement pictures in the paper or online, you go, where are all these ugly people? Do they not get married? Sure they do, but the magic of covering up the flaws takes place during the engagement time. Just always keep that in mind. We're good at covering flaws. The newspaper is not going to put a picture of you in the paper that says you're getting married that doesn't make you look like a model. They're going to cover up the blemishes. They're going to cover up the wrinkles. The problem is that in marriage, you can do that through the engagement period, but in marriage, all of those things are going to be seen clearly. And so you don't marry someone based on this ideal of perfection. You marry someone with your eyes wide open, and you don't see that picture that gets put in the paper. You see that person that you've dated and come to know, and you see their flaws, and you love them anyway. That's agape love. That's love that loves self-sacrificially. That's love that says, I love the other person so much that I love them even in the middle of all the stuff I know about them. Listen, you think it's easy being married to me? You think it's a walk in the park? You think Denise gets up every day and goes, that's my man. I just think he's the greatest. Most of the time, I'm sure, that's true. But there are days... And they're just like, I'm sure there are days for you when that's probably not the expression that you want to have for your mate. Because you begin to see things. Over time, I mean, we've been been together 40 years. There's nothing about this woman that I don't know. She cannot surprise me so far. Because I've, I've seen just about every circumstance and every situation. And I've loved her through every bit of it. And she has done the same for me. So being patient is important 
in a marriage. It's part of your emergency kit. Because when you wake up one day and go, where is this model that I thought I married? He's got wrinkles now. And he's getting kind of surly. I don't know what it is about women. Women are, 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 are kind of like, I guess, a good wine. They seem to get sweeter and better with age. Men, they're kind of like moldy bread, you know? I mean, really. I'm, and I'm talking about myself here. But it seems like the older we get, we just get surly. We start getting, and you know, the, the good thing is the sweetness of our wives kind of compensates for the surliness that begins to set in as we get older, guys. But here's the thing, patience, loving our mate, understanding their flaws and loving them through it is a big part of marriage. Second thing, never lose your ID. I learned this on the love boat. Genesis 1:27, 1 Peter 3, 7. Genesis 1 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. On the cruise ship, we had to carry an ID card, and that was our security. If you got off the boat, you better have it when you got back on. I mean, we went to this island that Sovereign of the Seas owned, and we, I rode one of those manta rays, you know. They'll let you, let you get on the back of this thing. I mean, I could... I was young and foolish, all right? That's my excuse. I'm riding this thing that could probably swallow me. But it was a lot of fun. And we got, you know, we played all that. But when it come time to get back on the boat, if you didn't have your ID, you could forget it. It was a security feature. Keeping your ID, your identification in marriage is a security feature for your marriage. Understanding your identity in Christ and then understanding the role that God has called you to in marriage. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 11 says, However, in the Lord neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. God created male and female for a reason. He created us to be different, to fulfill different roles in our marriage, because Men are to love their wives the way Christ loved the church. Women are to follow, love their husbands, and follow their godly leadership. Now, that doesn't mean, mean that women become doormats to men who become surly. You're not just supposed, and, and you're not supposed to allow yourself, ladies, to be mistreated or abused. There's nowhere in the scripture that it says that when a person begins to abuse another person, that marriage is an excuse for that. It's never an excuse for misbehavior. But here's the thing. If we would follow the formula, if we keep our ID, if we have men who love their wives desperately and are willing to sacrifice and to give up their life for them, and we have women in a marriage who say, you know, I trust the love of my husband so much that I'm going to follow his godly leadership. I'm not going to be a doormat. I'm not going to be a servant. I didn't get married to, to cook and to clean. That's not my primary responsibility, but it is my responsibility to find a way to lovingly follow the leadership that God has given my husband in this relationship and if you can keep your ID and the two of you find those roles that God has called us to and live within them you're going to find out that you're going to have a good marriage third thing service is the key to unity service is the key to unity. Romans chapter 12 verse 10 says be devoted to one another in brotherly love give preference to one another in honor. There's two things you can't forget when you go on a cruise. Food and service. I mean, it really is amazing. I was, we were walking from breakfast. Well, actually, we were walking to breakfast from our cabin one morning, and I passed one of the stewards, and I said, look, we're, we're running a little bit low on towels. And he must have apologized 10 times. I said, look, it's okay. You know, we'll, we'll survive. We just, we just need a couple extra towels. So we, we go to breakfast, which is, I mean, anything that you can think of. And if you can think of it, and if it's not there, you tell them, and they'll supply it for you. So we experienced that. We got back to our cabin. By the time we got back to our cabin, not only did we have towels, but they had been sculpted into animals, and they were sitting on the bed. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never walked into my bathroom at home, and Denise has sculpted a towel into a pelican that I'm about to use to get in the shower. I wish she would learn how to do that. I kind of like that. But the point is, whatever we could think of that we needed was provided. It was a perfect environment. It's hard not to enjoy something like that, you know? And this is the thing. How does it relate to marriage? 
Marriage is designed for service. It's a man serving his wife. It's a wife serving her husband. It's a man thinking about his wife, investigating his wife, getting to know his wife. And when I'm talking about investigating your wife, I'm not talking about hiring an investigator. I'm talking about you becoming the investigator to find out everything there is to know about her so that you can meet her needs. Men, you think about her and what makes her happy, and you focus on that. Forget about what your needs are. Don't worry about it. Because here's the thing. In the marriage, if she's doing the same thing, your needs are going to be met by her. Her needs are going to be met by you. And you're going to have a marriage that's going to last way over 40 years and be a lot better even than ours. Because that service, learning to serve and to put each other first, is the key to unity and being happy in a marriage relationship. Number four, when the sea gets rough, keep moving. Mark chapter 6 says, When it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he, being Jesus, was on the land, seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them. At about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he intended to pass by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got in the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. I've never been seasick a day in my life until this trip. I've been out deep sea fishing on a 60-foot boat that was out 100 miles in the Gulf Stream. And we were, we were catching fish left and right. And I mean, they were peop- there were people hanging over the side. And I was eating bologna sandwiches and riding on the front of the boat and having the time of my life. It never bothered me. But there's something about that size boat. It was 970 feet long. Something about that size. And the seas got up to about 8 to 10 feet. And what that means with a boat that's that big is that you can just, you, you can just feel it doing this just a little bit and about six o'clock I turned green never been green before but I mean I I it was and I, I and I began to understand something as long as I kept moving I wasn't throwing up if I stopped and stood still within two minutes I was so nauseous that I had to run to find a place And so from 6 p.m. until 5 a.m. the next morning, I walked that ship from the top to the bottom. If there's anything you want to know about a cruise ship, come and see me. Because I've seen it. I've talked to somebody. I walked, they let me walk through the kitchen just to have a new place to walk through. I mean, I was, I I it it was it was one of the worst feelings I've ever had. But as long as I kept moving, I was okay. You know, after Jesus fed the 5,000, the disciples got in the boat on the Sea of Galilee and and, and Jesus didn't want to get involved in this movement that was going to make him king. So the disciples started across the Sea of Galilee and they were rowing and they ran into a storm. Now here's the four things that they did to get to the other side. Number one, they didn't stop rowing when the sea got rough. They just stayed at the oars and stayed focused on the other side. Here's the thing that happens in too many marriages. The first time the sea gets rough, everybody wants to find a lifeboat. Everybody wants to get off. You want to put on the life preserver, jump in the water, and take your chances. Don't do it. Stay at the oars. Keep moving. Keep rowing. Keep moving forward. Why? Well, because the second thing, Jesus didn't come until the fourth watch of the night. Now, the fourth watch is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. In other words, it was not early on when they got in trouble that Jesus showed up. It was later on when they were desperate. And and this, this often happens. That's why it's important to keep rowing. When your marriage gets in trouble, believe that God wants you to stay together. And don't give up the fact that God can make a difference in your marriage if you call on him. As Jesus was walking by, the disciples cried out to him because they were afraid. And, and this, is, this is what we need to do. We need to, we need to cry out to Jesus. Jesus waited until the disciples would see if they would recognize him. Now, 
I find that kind of interesting since Jesus is probably the only one that would be walking on the surface of the water out in the middle of a storm. But the disciples recognized him, and when they did, and they called on him, he got in the boat. That's the third thing. Marriages that get in trouble, if you'll keep moving, and if you'll focus on the Lord, call on his name, ask him to come into your relationship, he can put the pieces that are broken back together. And I'm talking about pieces that you thought would never fit again can be brought back together by Jesus when you call on him because he wants your marriage to be a success. Notice what the Bible says. When Jesus got in the boat, the sea was calm and they reached their destination. There's never been a marriage when people call on the name of the Lord and he comes into the marriage that has failed. Because if both people will submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit by the power of God through Jesus Christ, His Son, that marriage can be protected and it can be restored no matter what you think you're going through. And the final thing, love doesn't stop when the boat docks. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Not only this, but also we exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings perseverance, perseverance, proven character, proven character hope hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us folks from the moment we got on that boat every need was met I mean it was incredible it was a perfect environment for a marriage or relationship to flourish but when it was time to get off the boat there was no doubt that the cruise was over because on Thursday morning they basically fed us breakfast and said, all right, everybody go stand in your designated squares. So we got all of our luggage, all of our stuff, and we went and stood where we were supposed to stand, and the the one goal they had was to get us off the boat. The party's over. It's time to go back to the real world. And that that transition was kind of rough. I mean, they opened up that door, and it was like all of a sudden they were herding us out, and about 20 minutes later, Denise and I are standing in the parking lot with our luggage, and I promise I didn't look at her and go, well, the cruise is over. We just as well call the divorce lawyers. No. We understood that marriage doesn't take place on the love boat. Marriage takes place once you get back. It's nice to have those experiences. It's nice to be able to go, but marriage is lived out in the real world. And living in the real world requires a real, genuine relationship with Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that holds two people together. Let me finish with this story. While we were out in California, we went up to Tahoe, and we went to a place called Lake Truckee. Actually, it's called Donner Lake now. And it's interesting, Truckee was an Indian guide who helped westward pilgrims who went from Springfield, Illinois to California and Oregon in 19, the early 1940s, the whole decade of the 40s. Uh, the gold rush didn't really begin in earnest until about 1949. So these pilgrims, uh, 1849, so these pilgrims were going across the country in wagon trains and they were going taking their families, all their possessions, going to California and to Oregon because it was a land of opportunity where there was a lot of land available. You could stake your claim and you could live your life and start anew. And so a lot of people were doing that. And while we were in Truckee, we went to the Reed Donner Memorial. Now, the Reed Donner Party is a tragic story in U.S. history and in westward expansion. What happened is they took a cutoff the Hastings cut off. They were convinced that there was a shortcut, and 87 of them didn't get to the Sierra Nevada mountains before the snows began in November of 1846. And when they got there, the snow was eventually would get to be 23 feet deep. It covered the cabins that they built to survive. They had to fashion steps to go out of the cabin to be able to find wood to keep the fires going. They ran out of their provisions. Many of them starved to death. And there's a terrible, tragic ending to that story about what the survivors had to do in order to stay alive. But once they got back, the survivors, there were 44 that lived out of 87. 
once the rescue party, several people died in a rescue effort to try to go get them. They did a study on who survived and why. Because for four months, think about it, November, December, January, February, they were totally isolated, no hope, no food, very little food, very little water, turning to desperate measures in order to survive. What made the difference between the ones who gave up and the ones who persevered and lived? Relationships. If you look, the mothers with children had a will to live because of the need to take care of their little ones. The married couples were devoted to each other, and each one wanted to live because of the relationship that they were in. Those that were single and had no friends, those that were were traveling, that were not really part of the group, but were hired hands, they died as early as December. And many of them didn't make it. And it wasn't just about the ones that were married. It was about the ones that had extended relationships. They cared about somebody. Somebody meant something to them. And their will to live revolved around their faith and their relationship with each other. That's what marriage is. If you want to see a marriage that's going to last and remain strong and be vibrant and not just be two people that are living together until they die, but two people who have a vibrant living relationship, it'll be because of faith and the love that they have for each other that they nurture and care for throughout their life so that when it comes back to them, then they've got something that God has done in their life that's special that they can hang on to. You know, I often wondered, three children, when the last one, Allison, got married a few years ago, moved out of the house, you know, when Denise and I sat down across the table and realized it was just me and her, what holds you together at that point? I'll tell you, it's whether or not you've made the investment spiritually and emotionally into each other as husband and wife over the years, and then you discover there's this whole new pool of love and relationship depth that you didn't know existed, that you get back to that point where you were when you were first dating and when you first got married. And it's a beautiful, God-honoring thing when we do that. I want to encourage you this morning with this message. Marriage is a beautiful thing. Our culture undermines it. Our culture puts little faith in it. Our culture mocks it. Our culture says it doesn't matter anymore, that the family doesn't matter. Can I just tell you, it's God's plan for life, for living this life in a way that honors Him and glorifies His Son, Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for these moments today that we've had. I pray as we have just a brief moment of invitation that if there are those, Lord, whose relationship is struggling in this hour of their lives together, that they would hear these words and be encouraged by them today and that you would use them to draw them close together and closer to you. In Jesus' name, 